Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast. As always, my name is Mark, and here with me today, a game designer, publisher, and co-host of my personal favorite board gaming podcast, Ludology, Gil Hova. Thanks for coming on the show, Gil. Thanks for having me, Mark. This is going to be super exciting. We're going to go over your history of designing games, publishing games, as well as talking about uh, your work with the Ludology podcast, because like I said, I, it's at my absolute favorite board game podcast. I've told people before, uh, if you're listening to this one and not Ludology, you should fix that. Listen to both. Oh, both is ideal, but I mean, yeah. Ludology is kind of like the blueprint of like, okay, that's what I can set my sights toward to try to get that level of, of information and quality. So it's super exciting to have you on. Thank you. I appreciate uh, it. A lot of the work was done by Jeff, Ryan, and Mike before me, so uh, they deserve a lot of the praise as well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, it, it's still going strong. Like I, I've recently... I got a part-time job where I'm commuting more, so I've been I've had time to catch up on podcasts, and I caught up on like the last like 50 episodes of Ludology over the last couple of months. And uh, yeah, you and Emma are, are awesome. I, the transition was completely seamless, and, and the new episodes have been have been great. And and I think the quality is maintained no matter who has been hosting. Honestly, Emma's been absolutely amazing to work with. I'm really really happy she's on. Yeah, yeah. Let's start at the beginning. As as with pretty much everyone I, I talk to on this podcast, my first question is always, what got you into modern board gaming? What got you into the hobby? So as a kid, I always wanted to be a video game designer. That was kind of my dream, to, be a, uh, to, to make video games, because I loved playing video games so much. And in my early 20s, I figured if I was going to realize this dream... I should start with board games because board games are a more pure form of design. Uh, that was my thinking back then. And if I knew how to design a board game, I could apply that to video games. So I started researching board games out there. And I'd, I'd played some board games as a kid, uh, not just the standard classics, quote unquote, but also uh, I had Car Wars growing up. I had a lot of Steve Jackson games growing up, Illuminati, Ogre. Um, I still have, uh, from my childhood, I'm so proud of owning this, a, a sort of a variant of Ogre called Globo, which reskins Ogre uh, to alien babysitters and their evil and destructive insect kids. It is one of the <laughs> weirdest games that I own. So I had a much more varied uh, game education growing up than than most Uh friend of mine let me Battletech and I was an idiot kid and I never gave it back. I had a bunch of those old TSR micro games back when micro game meant a small game you packed in a little plastic clamshell. Like Ogre was originally a micro game. I had one called they, They've Invaded Pleasantville. Uh, that was a micro game that I had. I even had Can't Stop as a kid, uh, which I had no idea, you know, who designed it and what the history was. But uh, that was really amazing when I got back into board games and I realized Can't Stop was considered a classic from a legendary designer. This company that I'd followed as a kid, Steve Jackson, they had just come out with this game called Munchkin that was getting really popular. So I was getting into gaming around 2000, 2001. And I started picking things up. I played Catan. I played Puerto Rico. And Puerto Rico was the game that really changed me. That was the one that made me realize that I liked board games better than I liked video games. Uh, so that was it for video games. I became a board game nut. I bought all that I could. I learned all that I could. And I tried to design board games. So I was a designer from the beginning, you know. And uh, it's just that I my I stopped my dream of wanting to be a video game designer and started a dream of wanting to be a board game designer instead. And that took a long time because, the number one, the resources to learn how to design board games – there were some, and they were good. Uh, there was the Board Game Designers Forum. There was Protospiel start, uh, launched early on, uh, like a few years in. And then uh, a few local video game designers launched a board game design group near me. Um, one of them has since gone on to design the video game Killer Queen. Uh, and if you look close, he's got a video game – I'm sorry, he's got a board game that Mayday released last year also. Josh DeBonis is his name. And Eric Zimmerman also co-founded the group, and he's since gone on to design the meta the meta game and Quantum. And he teaches both of them teaches at NYU. Uh, while I'm I teach at NYU also. I'm an adjunct uh, as a game design teacher. So so yeah, that they 
once they founded that game design group, uh, that really helped my craft because I was now play testing every month instead of play testing like every two or three months. Uh, I, there was a game design group in Albany. Uh, at the time, I was based in northern New Jersey. Uh, I'm now in the. I'm still technically in New Jersey, but I'm really in the New York City area. But when I was in northern New Jersey, I would make the two hour, two and a half hour drive to Albany because there were a bunch of uh, designers in Albany who got together. And from that group, uh, there were a bunch of games that came out. The biggest one is probably Sidereal Confluence. Uh, Tau Seti brought that game like crazy to those events. And The Sands of Time, which Spielworks released last year, uh, was also a game that Jeff had been bringing there for years. So uh, it's funny that you go to a game group long enough and you start seeing all these games pop out. And certainly the New York City group, there have been a ton of amazing games that have come out of that group the past few years. The biggest one probably being Century Spice Road uh, was probably the biggest one that came out of that group. But Arboretum came out of the group. Quantum was playtested like crazy. Obviously, all my games were playtested there like crazy. So yeah, that was my entry point. So it was like 10 years between 2000 and 2010 where I was slowly accumulating playtesting resources and getting a handle on this thing. And nowadays, you've got all these amazing blogs. Uh, you've got game design courses. Like NYU has an undergrad and a grad degree in game design. Granted, it's kind of aimed at digital games, but we do have a lot of board game instruction resources, and we even teach an RPG class. So there's so many ways you can learn about making a game nowadays. Cardboard Edison has some amazing information on their website. We've got Unpub now. Uh, we've got so many resources you can go to. And obviously, Ludology, when Jeff launched Lud Ludology, that was really great. Uh, Gabe Barrett's pad podcast, uh, Board Game Design Lab, is a fantastic resource. Uh, so... Nowadays, I see new designers getting up to speed much more quickly than I did because they have access to all these resources. While I had access to some resources, I don't think we had the grammar. I don't think we had the vocabulary. I don't think uh, we had as much of an infrastructure that we do now. The number of resources is pretty remarkable. Like I, I'm f relatively newer to kind of being in this community. I, I first started playing games probably oh well it was probably eight nine years ago yeah that's not a small amount of time that's a good amount Man, of time i i had to i had to double check the math in my mind yeah. because i've been telling people six years i'm like wait a minute it's not been yep. six years it was actually right after it was soon after dominion was released and was that oh eight oh nine that was um, 10, 2010 I and believe. that was the game that hooked me i and could be wrong there you're probably right might be 2009 dominion yeah but yeah, Dominion hooked a lot of people. That was uh, yeah. a really huge game. And I mean, even just in the past couple of years, though, we've gotten a lot of resources. Cardboard Edison, as you said, it has has been growing. It's kind of a staple now. Uh, I've been really enjoying Jeff and Isaac's uh, Building Blocks of Tabletop yes. Design book. I think that's going to be a fantastic resource for many, many people. Yeah, yeah. I mentioned Eric Zimmerman. He wrote a textbook with K Katie Salen, and it's called Rules of Play. And again, mm -hmm. it's it's not exclusively about board games, but a lot of principles you can use from that book in board games. In fact, I'd say you could use most of it. It's a textbook, so it's a little on the expensive side, but it's also very, very good. And that's also a resource that wasn't around when I started. Yeah, so, and it's interesting that you began with Aspirations as a game designer first and then later kind of realized that the board gaming was what you wanted to do what were the video games that you enjoyed that inspired you to go into design first well it's interesting because there's i think there's a few reasons i left video games and i think one of them was i realized i like board games better um at the time i loved uh, i think my two favorite games at the time that i left video games were half-life and grim fandango but as I'd see the new video games come out, they would all have like some half naked woman holding an enormous gun. And <laughs> it was like, this is kind of a boring note. Can you pick, can we please pick another note? This is kind of dumb. And while I think there's, there's themes in the board game world that are repetitive and some of them are not terribly healthy. Like there's been a lot of talk. We did an episode on ludology last year about the impact of colonial themes uh, in board games and what they really apply versus what the publishers are thinking they're saying or not saying. But even that, I think, is – it's an abstracted violence there 
and it's something that's more implied, uh, which I'm not going to say that makes it better, but it's a little harder to spot. You know, it's just so much more blindingly obvious when it's a half naked woman with an enormous gun on the cover of like half the games that were coming out, you know, in the early aughts when I finally, or the late 90s when I finally decided I had enough of video games. Uh, but I wanted to make games more like Roller Coaster Tycoon. That was a game I loved. Out of the Park Baseball, still a fantastic game that um, I'm not allowed to play. Like, I do not allow my myself to play that game because oh, good, I'm goodbye, in the everyone. Same boat. Yeah. Yeah. I put I, hundreds I of hours in that game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Phenomenal games. Uh, but and it also showed me that you can make a game that's appealing without violence. And one thing I like about board games is you don't need a violent theme to have a successful game or at least an overtly violent theme. You could have, you could have competition and most board games have some form of competition, but you don't need to ha- for it to be incredibly bloody and gory and you don't need to threat to render internal organs at incredibly high resolutions and high frame rates and boast about how realistic your blood spatter is. I, I just don't think that's appealing to me anymore. You can shoot these 1,500 kinds of guns. I don't care. I really don't care. That's not something that appeals to me, and I think it doesn't appeal to a lot of people. Um, And I'm happy to see that there's a lot of indie games that really push back against that and try to give you all sorts of different experiences. And I kind of wish that AAA games um, knew that there was a little more to gaming than just blowing each other up. I'll get off my soapbox I was going to mention the the indie game scene with with digital gaming. Have you been tempted to poke your head back into digital gaming now that there's presumably like board games there's a lot more resources and in in, in the the cost to entering game design as a designer have lowered since those early aughts oh i absolutely have been enjoying a lot of video games especially digital games monument valley for me is uh, an absolutely amazing extraordinary game going back to the nyu game design scene frank lands uh the who runs the game center uh, his game is he, – he did a, a, a clicker game, an idle game called Universal Paperclips. That's one of my favorite games, period. The games coming out of the queer gaming scene, especially uh, interactive fiction, like what Porpentine is doing, is amazing. Her writing is is off the charts amazing. And so – I really like a lot of the stuff that's coming out there. I got a Switch a few months ago, so I've been enjoying a, quite a few games there. Slay the Spire, I think, is a phenomenal game. While it is a, a fighting game, the focus isn't really in the fighting. The focus is in the card play, and I think that makes it interesting. And the and the fighting is so abstracted in the game. It's, it's not nearly as bad as something like uh, Gears of War or any of those other ultra-violent modern games. Yeah, and, and, and interestingly, as you know, Slay the Spire, the designer of, or developer of that game, uh, was an avid Netrunner player. Oh, yeah, we had him on the show. So, yeah, yeah he uh, he's a huge Netrunner fan and obviously a big Dominion fan. So it was so interesting to talk to him. And I, I also want to say I'm, I don't want to make it sound like those violent video games are uh, – there shouldn't be any of them. I don't want to make it sound like they shouldn't exist. I mean they have a place. Absolutely. I just don't want them to be dominant. I don't want them to be the only game that you can pick up at a at like a GameStop. And of course, they're not. I mean, I think I think Pokemon has been a really fun franchise. I mean, obviously if you look to look really read really into the theme of Pokemon, you know, it starts to get a little disturbing, but it's still fantastical enough that it's a really fun ride and I think that's a that's a game that I really enjoy, the the whole Pokemon series. I haven't gotten Sword or Shield yet because um, I don't have a lot of time these days, and you need a lot of time. I, I got Let's Go Eevee, and I really enjoyed that, although I never got around to finishing it. Yeah, and, and, and continuing down this line, because uh, it wouldn't be a thoughtful game or podcast without going off on some tangent. <laughs> um, I think often about how the medium itself affects those kinds of thematic decision-making, because, like, in board gaming, you have some bloody violent games, like you said, but one of the most popular video game genres is the first person shooter. We've mm-hmm. had one board game that's tried to capture that feeling, uh, yep. ad- adrenaline, from what Spe- I know. Yeah. Specifically, that's the more like a deathmatch, a first person shooter deathmatch. Yeah. Yeah. 
there's also Frag. Uh, Steve Jackson had a game called Frag mm. uh, like about five or six years ago, and that was the same idea as Adrenaline. Uh, I think Adrenaline handled it much more elegantly because Steve Jackson is very still very old school and very much into direct conflict and uh, zero-sum interactions. And I think it was missing some of the really valuable negative feedback loops that Adrenaline built in. Like, for example, in Ad- Adrenaline, every time you get killed – you respawn and you're worth fewer points to the other players. And that's an amazing mechanism because it means that it disincentivizes going after the same player repeatedly, which if that happened, it would be a degenerate game state. It would be kind of, uh, it's not fun for the player who's always getting shot. And it's not as interesting because you want to incentivize players to go after the stronger players. That's more interesting that the game's asking a much more interesting question there. And uh, obviously there's, there's the super hot card game uh, which is based off the super hot video game. And uh, that also did a little bit of that as well. Uh, but Adrenaline did it really nicely. But to your point, I think uh, video games are very visceral because they can take all of the complications of uh, being the arbiter and the adjudicator of the game and hide that all into the CPU. And all your care, all you care about is you controlling the player. You know, I talk... I've talked on previous ludologies about uh, the avatar and the agent, uh, the avatar being the thematic representation of the player and the agent being the mechanical representation of the player. And video games are really good at getting a solid overlap between all three. And I think the first person genre is really popular because you get such a solid overlap of all three and you really feel like you're in there. Uh, whereas board games are built on abstractions. They, they can't help it. Board games, by necessity, abstract And they're generally very repetitive also. The more repetition you have in a game, the less connection you're going to have with the theme uh, and the more you're going to see the game from an agential point of view. Like the avatar kind of melts away and you only look at the agent and how can I get more video – how can I get more victory points? How can I get more victory points? So I think that's why board games, at least from the Euro perspective, they tend to really do well with very loose – and perhaps even boring themes, uh, because the players are so connected and getting their hands dirty with the mechanism, having a weird and interesting mechanism can be a draw for a board game. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, In my experience, at least, it's even abstracted. The board games can make these thematic connections that, in description, if you were to, to describe it to someone, it often sounds like, yeah, I wouldn't have any emotional investment in that really weak connection but while playing the game they can often create rich experiences like i mean looking at something like fog of love which in many of its situations is just a basic prison prisoner's dilemma situation Mm -hmm. between the two players but give it that those trappings in the context of the game and it can really feel emotionally fraught and make you think about relationships in your own life even if abstracted looking back from a from a you know ten thousand foot view you're like oh it's just the prisoner's dilemma yeah uh and i think what that game does well is that resolution mechanism is so dead simple and they do such a good job at switching up contexts uh and making you feel like you read out the card and You talk about, okay, we have to have our dinner with our parents now, and one of them says something awful. You know, what would our character do? And it really gives you the freedom to explore that character and to say, well, that character would do this and that. Uh, it's, It's an interesting game. I think it's a really wonderful game. I've shown it to people who also think it's a wonderful game, and I've shown it to people who feel like it doesn't go far enough in either direction, which is an interesting bit of feedback. And I'm sure Jacob got it like crazy uh, when he was testing the game. But the game's been so wildly successful, and I'm so happy for Jacob that um, he's had it. I I think the game is wonderful. Oh, I uh, do too. Yeah, yeah. Actually, but the game had yeah. a very deep, like emotional. I, it created a deep emotional reaction to me. Oh, where that's I've, wonderful. I've not wanted to play it. Like I was. Oh, but not so wonderful. It almost scared me. <laughs> like yeah. How could this game be doing it to me? But I I don't know if the review will be posted by the time the podcast goes up. It might be. I've been working a very long time on a review that will – it's my most ambitious review yet. Wow. Um, You know, I played Depression Quest, you know, the video game Depression Quest by Zoe Quinn. That's the text one, right? 
Yes, it's a uh, it's twine based. I played that. Yeah. Yeah, and I had the almost the same reaction to that one in that I felt so protective of the av- of my avatar that I went through it once. I got them as good a resolution as possible, and I'm like, I don't want to play this again just because I don't want to hurt Alex. Uh, and it was such a great. I, I think it's a it's an absolutely amazing game, and I think that the fact that it got that reaction out of me, I think, is such a a tribute to the skill of, 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 of Quinn's and how good a designer she is. Yeah. All right. Let's get back in terms of talking about your experience with games and game design. Uh, so your first published design is Prolix. Yes. Um, it, which you then published what a sequel to essentially with Wordsy. I would say it's almost a do over. Okay. Of, of it, like I'll tell anyone who listens that you have a choice between Prolix and Wordsy. Buy Wordsy; it's a better game. Um, it does everything that I want to do with Prolix. I did with Wordsy because even in the it was I'd say five years between the release and those two games, and um, I grew several orders of magnitude as a game designer uh, between those those two releases. And I think Wordsy is such a better game. Uh, it's it's faster. It's not near. Prolix is a very confusing game. Prolix is a game made by a designer who thought that a game is a series of mechanisms with sometimes a, a theme put uh, put on top of it. So when I designed Prolix, I was really focused on the mechanisms. Oh, is this a cool mechanism? Oh, is that a cool mechanism? Now I went up with a bunch of really cool mechanisms that kind of sort of work together as an okay game. Wordsy was made by a designer who hopefully understood that the game is about the experience at the end of the day and the mechanisms serve that experience which means you could take a really cool mechanism out of the game and replace it with a much more boring mechanism and the game can improve it can get better because the game is not about having a really cool mechanism it's how those mechanisms support the intended experience and wordsy is always prolix and wordsy both have always been games about making long words and making players feel really smart wordsy does that in half the time uh, with m- far, far simpler rules. Like, you don't understand what, when I say you, the average new player does not understand how to score Prolix until after the first game. And I've never liked games with that dynamic, and I especially don't like it in a family-oriented game. And I think Wordsy, by the second or third round, you get it. You totally understand what it's all about. Uh, and I think that's one reason why players uh, have really warmed to Wordsy, and they really, really enjoy it. So, so was simplification the main area of improvement between those two? Uh, in terms of the game's design, absolutely. So there's a few things that improved. One of them was Prolix has interrupt rules. So it's always one player's turn, but other players could interrupt. And I did that because when it was just strictly turn-based, the game took forever. Like there were people who would slow the game down and it would be boring. And I was looking for an organic solution to that. The interrupt solution was mechanically, I still think a really interesting solution, but it created all sorts of emergent edge cases that made the game rather fiddly. Whereas Wordsy deals with it by being a real-time game, an unapologetic real-time game, but... It's not a game that rewards Twitch reaction speed, uh, which is important. I didn't want either game to be about fastest player wins because that creates almost a set-like uh, disadvantage or characteristic to the game. Mm-hmm. With set, there's one player. If that player is good, that player is good, and that's it. And it's really hard to get better in that game. Like You don't see someone improving at set to that point to beating an ex- uh, that experience to that's not even the right because other players have the characteristic. It's just not interesting when you have a really experienced player. The really experienced player gets to play the game and nobody else does. I mean, that's really the big problem with Set is that they're the only person who plays the game. Uh, for those who don't know Set, Set is a real-time game that's like a pattern matching game uh, where uh, you put these cards out on the board and you shout Set when you see a, a pattern. Uh, and when you're really good at Set, you'll just say Set, Set, Set. And that's it. Uh, And nobody else will get to play the game because the one person who sees the set will always claim it. And I remember uh, I was at a game group one day and uh, a gamer came by and she wanted like her quest. I could see her like wandering 
from game store to game store looking for so- someone who would give her a challenge at set. So, you know, she laid the cards down in front of me and it was set, 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 set. And then she said, okay, thanks for the game. And she picked it up and I could see her like in my mind's eye leaving the game store into like um, into a headwind, a rainy headwind and going on to the next game store to find a worthy competitor for her at set. I mean, that's that's an issue with the game. And I didn't want that with something like uh, Prolix or Wordsy. So Prolix, I had this fiddly rule. Um where you get these penalties the more you interrupt, you know, and that took a lot of tweaking. And Wordsy is just, like, it's uh, everybody's turn, but the player who's the first to write down their word gets to flip a timer, and everybody else has 30 seconds to write down their word. And I found 30 seconds was a good time, because it's a long time. You might be new to the game and panic when you see someone flipping the timer, so you spend 10 seconds panicking, then you realize you still have 20 seconds to come up with a word. Mm -hmm. And that's actually quite forgiving. So It's it's the galaxy trucker thing. Yeah, it's not a useful strategy in the game to rush the other player. Like, you can do that a little bit, but it's not something that you can really do that's generally effective, because most people within 30 seconds will come up with something with a reasonable, reasonably scoring word. And then if you're playing three or more players, the same player can't flip the timer in consecutive turns. So with these relatively simple rules, I took care of those real-time issues that I was having in Prolix. And the game just plays so much better because of it. I think also, I I gotta be honest, I think the fact that I self-published it meant that I... And honestly, when uh, Prolix came out, Zev, he was still running Z-Man at the time... He gave me the opportunity to sort of dictate how the cover should look, and I had no idea how it should look because I was barely even a game designer. I didn't know the first thing about product design. And nowadays, being a a publisher, I do have a better handle on product design. I'm not going to say I'm perfect, but I'd say I'm decent at it. And I talked to a few friends. I got some advice. First off, the name. uh, Prolix sounds like a medication, (laughs) Uh, even though the name is thematic. I found that if you have to explain a name to someone, if you have to put a definition of what the name means in the English language on the back of the box, you need a new name. To the point of nobody knew that Prolix was a word game, even though it said word game on the cover, whereas Wordsy does not say word game on the cover, but the fact that it looks like a dictionary, that's how he made the cover, and it says Wordsy in big letters, everybody knows it's a word game. It just reads like a word game. And in terms of product design, in terms of the name, it's far, far, far better. So yeah. I think between those things, understanding game design better and understanding product design better, I think that's why Wordsy is such a big improvement. Yeah, and, and even looking at the cover, it's got this kind of formal typeface and uh, your, the, the formal ferret logo prominently displayed f- even fits in with the design of the game yep. cover. Yep, we yeah, put it in gold nice. leaf. I've told my graphic designers that they have liberty to muck with the formal ferret to make it fit in, which I think is always a a nice touch. And on the side and on the sides of the box, I have the regular formal ferret logo. And I think uh, so I understand there's an argument for always keeping your mark the same. But I think I, I like it when when there's a little bit of wiggle room there. And I should point out that the graphic design for Wordsy is done by Scott Hartman. Uh, who at one point was a member of my New York City game design group. Uh, He's since moved on to California, uh, but he does a lot of graphic design for various board games. He does work for TMG, uh, does work for occasional work for indie game studios, though I think they have a full-time graphic designer now. But Scott does really, really good work. He's the one who designed the Formal Ferret logo also. He drew the Formal Ferret logo, so I'm infinitely thankful to him for that. Very nice. Yeah, that, that, that game design group... Like even hearing you talk about it, the, there were games associated with that. I didn't even I didn't know came out of that group. We just got back from PAX Unplugged, and at least twice I was talking to someone at a booth, and they mentioned that they were part of that game design group. Like that's significant in in terms of of reach into the hobby. And it's funny because we're not a terribly large group. Uh, we've recently grown, so we started – I mentioned that we used to do monthly meetings. Uh, then uh, a few years ago, like four years ago, we switched to weekly meetings. And I think the group started getting really good once we started doing weekly meetings. That's a very good tempo, and 
I know that's hard for people who may not have access to the resources that I do. So like if you don't live in a major metropolitan area, but if there's any way you can swing weekly play tests, your games will get so much better on a weekly tempo instead of a monthly tempo. And as of, I'd say a year, maybe a year and a half, we've been doing twice a week. We now do Tuesday evenings and Saturday most of the day. And that's like strapping yourself into a rocket. Like yeah. uh, the velocity that you get on those designs is absolutely unreal. Uh, but even then, the Tuesday night play tests, we get at most, I think our largest turnout was 17 people, which for a game design group is excellent, but for an average game group is not. And I hear about uh, the... Utah, the the game, I forget the name of the group in Utah. I think the Utah Game Designers Guild or something like that. Mm -hmm. They have way more people at, at meetings. They have a really, really amazing group there. And uh, Smooks Chen, who runs the Taiwan Board Game Design Group, he gets a lot of people at his. He said he got like 25 at least designers for his meeting, like re meeting regularly, which is uh, which shows you how fertile the scene is uh, over in, in Taiwan. But despite the fact that we've been a relatively small group, uh, we've had quite a few big hits. I mean, <laughs> another one is uh, Pipeline. You know, Ryan uh, oh, yeah. did a lot of testing of Pipeline at our group. Uh, he's also local to New York. Uh, but Ryan... Uh, found a better vehicle for his playtesting at some point. Uh, he started doing online playtesting. Uh, a lot of people use Tabletop Simulator. Ryan uses Vassal, a program called Vassal. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's actually a um, virtual advanced squad leader. There's an extra S in there, uh, and I forget what it's for, but that's what it was made for. It was made to play advanced squad leader online, and it got retrofitted, so now you can have just about any game in there. Uh, it's extremely user-unfriendly. Like, I have no idea how to use it, and I consider myself fairly tech-literate. Ryan said that he would help me with a few of it, but it's 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 really... If you can get the hang of Vassal, it can be really, really useful. Um, and it doesn't have the physics-based problems that Tabletop Simulator does. Because uh, Tabletop Simulator is ultimately a physics simulator when it doesn't need to be, and it'll very faithfully let you flip over the board and cards um <laughs> even though you that may not have been your intent uh so yeah i think um if you can get the hang of it you can do it but ryan switched to vassal and then he started play testing almost every night uh that's one reason why pipeline is so tight is because it's gotten so many play tests at least online and there's a risk there that when you do so much play testing online and isaac shalev has spoken about this that your game becomes really well suited for playing online and then you bring it out and play it in person and there may be rough edges because you encounter things because it was optimized to play, say, through Tabletop Simulator and not in person. So now I've got to do a little bit of retrofitting and make it work for an in-person game. So that's an interesting point uh, that he says he has to be thoughtful of when he works in Tabletop Simulator. Uh, so I think that's another option for people who might be living uh, away from a major metropolitan area is learn Tabletop Simulator, Tabletopia is another good resource, and Vassal. Any of those three, if you can get the hang of them, uh, you can play test with anyone anywhere in the world, and you might even be able to hurdle time zone issues and play with someone on the other side of the planet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I remember I downloaded Vassal once to try to play something in about 10 minutes searching through it to do literally anything I gave up. <laughs> it's daunting. Like, I yeah. think you need someone to teach you how to, how to use it. It's yeah, a very, sure. very complex program. Yeah. The second game you publish, or, or that you design, rather, yes. is Battle Merchants, which means you transition from a smaller word game to a larger, more Euro-style design. Uh, were there any particular challenges? Or, I mean, it, it's not necessarily that you finished Prolux and then Battle Merchants was the next thing you, you work on. I assume there were other designs in the mix there also, but were there any particular challenges in getting a larger game completed? Yeah, I mean, in terms of the timeline, I was working on both games at roughly the same time. I think I probably started on Battle Merchants sooner, uh, mm. but I was still doing monthly tests. So th this is the story with uh, Battle Merchants, is I have this really amazing auction mechanism that ca I can't get to work in any game. I'm sure you've heard the story. I've told uh, oh, yeah. Ludology countless times. <laughs> uh, so listen to our Ludology episode that we recorded live at Grand Con. I talk about my auction system in detail, but um, the short version of the story is I couldn't get this auction mechanism to work uh, in... Well, I got it to work in one game, but the game was boring. So... 
the auction mechanism was the only thing that worked in the game, and that was not a big enough part of the game to redeem it. So I built battle merchants around this auction mechanism, and then the game, the rest of the game rejected the auction mechanism. So I, I kicked out the auction mechanism, and I had this really solid game that Minion Games and James Matthey, uh, who sadly passed away earlier this year, it, he, uh, he signed the game and released it to uh, absolutely no success whatsoever. It was not a successful game, unfortunately. I'm super proud of it, even though um, I feel like the light bulb in terms of game design came on in between the time I signed it and in between between the time it came out. And if you go to drive through cards, you can find a small expansion for Battle Merchants called New Kingdoms that is a new set of kingdom cards that I think works better than the original game. And I think at that point I had a better understanding of what game design was. I think it's a better game because of it. And so the biggest challenge in that game was the theme, um, because the original theme was fight was building and selling fighting robots. And so what I tell everybody is I would say, hey, do you want to play my game about building and selling fighting robots? And they'd say, sure, I'll play your game about fighting robots. And you see the <laughs> difference. That's not yes. the same thing. So uh, it's a spreadsheet game, which is, I think, a, a fun kind of game to play, but not what you'd expect from a game that would that you'd expect to be about fighting robots, but it turns out it's not about fighting robots, it's about building and selling fighting robots. So once we changed it to a fantasy theme, we didn't have that problem anymore, and that was much, much better. So while I'm really proud of Battle Merchants, I don't see a future for it in Formal Ferret. It's it's just not a Formal Ferret game. I like modern themes much better these days. The theme was still kind of button pushing a little bit, and I think I had to get that out of my system a little bit, uh, making a game with an unsavory theme. Like, I really enjoy games with unsavory themes, um, and I don't know what that says about me, but I like how uncomfortable, I like the questions they ask, um, I like that they force me to think, and they make me realize that I'm the villain here, and I think there's good morality in there, that like, okay, let's unpack what we're doing and talk about the reality of what's happening here in a non-glorified way. Like, I think Infamous Traffic does that really well. Like, Mm -hmm. uh, you're starting this horrible war in China so you can go buy a nice hat in England. Uh, And I think that really, it's a really thoughtful design that shines a light on how uncomfortable and unpleasant the business is. And I've seen games that try to do this and or ostensibly try to do it and fail. You know, they, they wind up just glorifying the thing that they're trying to make fun of, uh, or at least satirize. So I think Battle Merchants did a good job with that, but I don't think I would push that button as hard. My newest game, High Rise, approaches that because it's a game about city building where you can uh, take corruption to extend your actions. People say... Like, I want my games to be apolitical. Like, I want my comics to be apolitical. I want my movies to be apolitical. And there's no such thing. I mean, everything's in a context. Um, Everything's going to be saying something. As a designer, both with Battle Merchants and High Rise, I made deliberate changes to reduce the political content of the game. Like, my graphic designer for High Rise wanted to specifically set it in Manhattan. And had we done that, we would have made a very specific statement about construction in Manhattan, that you need to be corrupt to construct in Manhattan. And that's not a statement that I think the game is about. So we just made it a generic city. I mean, the statement is still there, but it's not in the foreground. And likewise with Battle Merchants, you know, it is a game about arms merchants, which is unpleasant. And I've known people who will not play it because of that theme, and that is a completely valid reaction to it. But it's if I had set that game in the modern day, that would have been even harsher, and that would have been even more of a statement. So with both games, I diluted the political statement a little bit, but you can't remove it entirely. So when people say, I want to play a game that's completely apolitical, are you, sh- are you sure that's possible? Because I don't think it is. On On that topic, though, it's something I've been thinking about a lot. In terms of, I agree that any piece of art or any game or almost any experience you have is not, what's the word I'm trying to think of? Perhaps a moral or perhaps a societal. I get hung up on, on, on the argument being framed around politics necessarily, because while politics does influence a lot of our lives, obviously in a lot of pe- people's lives in any country, 
I get concerned by the assumption that politics necessarily infiltrates every single aspect of life and not like better not word community in general, rather. Yeah, I think a better word would be ethics, maybe, than yeah. politics. And I wonder when people say, you know, everything is political, they're saying everything has some kind of ethical slant to it. Yeah, and I think that's uh, that's reasonable, especially in just about every board game. Uh, a term that I use a lot on ludology is ortho game. Uh, or an ortho game is a game that you can win. It's mm-hmm. a game that has a winning condition. Uh, the way Richard Garfield defined it is that it ranks uh, every player's performance. So you see who performed best, who performed worst, and if necessary, everything in between. And so an ortho game, by nature, is making some ethical statement saying. X behavior is better than Y behavior. Uh, now, a lot of times I have to say this result is microscopic. You know, I'm not saying that it's going to slam you over the head every time. I mean, uh, you play a Haba game or you play a game that might be a little bit sillier. You know, you play uh, what's a, I'm trying to think of. Uh, you play Happy Salmon. You know, I'm not I would be hard pressed to look at ether- ethical repercussions of Happy Salmon. Yeah. So it's easy to go too far in this so i i don't want to um i don't want to overdo it but certainly you look at even a game like terraforming mars i know that terraforming mars uh has a colonial theme that is not as bad as others because you're terraforming a wasteland but at the same time there's a lot of colonial language they still use i mean they still in one of the expansions uh they have indentured servitude so um like how come this old colonial language slips back in to this game that is supposedly futuristic. Uh, it's an interesting question, you know, and, yeah. and it opens more ethical discussions. And I'm sure that uh, as we get, hopefully, uh, get closer to the reality of terraforming a planet, uh, we start looking at the ethical repercussions, you know, certainly like how do we decide – uh, who makes the decisions on how the planet is terraformed and that sort of thing. Uh, there was a lot of ethical questions baked into that, uh, that I think a game like Terraforming Mars can start to approach, even though obviously it won't bring up everything. But I think you look deep enough into a lot of games, you can start asking some interesting questions. Oh, absolutely. And I agree with you that I, I also enjoy games where it's very clear that I'm the villain of the story. Yes. Um, I think that's really interesting. And while I haven't designed any games, I'm, I'm, I'm one of those people who just has a bunch of ideas thrown into a, a Word document somewhere. Yeah. I've, I've noticed that a lot of my ideas are specifically that. It's it's let's look at the corrupting nature of, of this institution by having players play the players in those institutions. Yeah, uh, yeah. Which, which I think is something that games perhaps are or board games specifically, are well-suited to examine. Yep. At the same time, you know, it's it could be thorny, especially if it's an issue of, of which people are suffering about now. And mm-hmm. it creates a question of, well, exactly who is this for? Like, is this uh, – are you going to unintentionally celebrate what you're trying to satirize? Uh, I, that's the question I brought up before. Um, I'm going to look at a game like, okay, so I haven't played Santa Maria yet. I've only read the rules and I've read some of the discussion around it. And it seems like that's a game where ostensibly the designers were trying to satirize your colonization theme, but they never had that extra layer like an infamous traffic did. Like an infamous traffic, it knows that you know that it knows it's about corrupt people. Mm-hmm. Like, it's got enough self-awareness. The fact that, as I said before, you start a war in China to buy a hat. Like, that's ridiculous enough that you know that you're the bad guy. And you never get that extra layer from what I've read about in Santa Maria, which is um, – and that was a lot of the discussion about it. Like, this just seems to glorify colonization without having that extra – extra layer of awareness. Um, there's also questions of, uh, if you're, I mean, I mean, there's some interesting questions, even of a game like spirit Island, which I think is a really interesting take on colonialism, but it still falls into some tropes, uh, that are, uh, that can be problematic. 
like the idea of, um, you know, native people are always connected to the land and have some sort of magical spiritual power, you know, that sort of thing. You know, that's a trope. And uh, I'm not saying that it's a horrible game and nobody should play it because of it. It's just a worthy discussion. Like this is this is all stuff that's worthy of bringing up um, and questions of how do we represent native people in a game? Uh, how can we get native people into the industry so they can represent themselves in games, I think is probably the best way to frame that question, uh, rather than trying to speak for them and wind up with, uh, okay, you just put out another, another game whose cover mixes the traditions of three different nations, and it's set in this completely different part of America than all three of them, and uh, it uses clothing from the wrong century, and everything's completely wrong about it. You know, How do we avoid those issues? Yeah, I, I recall there was, I don't remember the name of the game, there was one that it was Native American themed around a particular area and had totem poles, but actual totem poles were literally across the continent, like they never existed yeah. among that group, which is just an egregious oversight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think we're at the point with board games where that stuff is, you can make the argument that it should always have mattered, but nowadays it matters, I think, you know, and nowadays there's enough people from different backgrounds playing the games that, yeah, you should get it right. Because if you don't, someone from the background will play the game and they'll be like, this is garbage. Like this is this is super ignorant and they didn't even bother to ask. So I think it's 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 worthwhile there. Yeah. So I forgot how we got on this tangent. Oh, about uh, games where you play the villain. So yes. a game where you play the villain, it's very easy to screw it up. It's very mm -hmm. easy to get it wrong. Uh, you really have to do your homework. You really have to talk to people who were affected by the real-life villain to see if it's even a story that's worth telling. It could be really difficult and painful. And uh, the worst-case scenario, I'm thinking of that uh, there's a video game that Jeff talked about that uh, was about the trauma soldiers experience when they return home. And people who were affected that by that didn't feel like the game was uh, was sensitive enough to their plight, uh, and the game never got made because of it. Um, mm. And granted, there's a lot wrapped up in there, because when you look at how most people view it a game, most people, I'm talking about average person on the street, still think of games as something kids play. You know, adults only play games if it's like pickup basketball or gambling, you know, the idea of recreation using your brain is still to a lot of people very deeply weird. Uh, you know, this is something that kids do. So when you look at a game that not only has an adult theme, but an adult theme that challenges you, that's something that they, with all due respect to them, can't process. And they fall into the conclusion that it must be making fun of us. When in a lot of cases, that's the exact opposite of what's going on. Uh, it's similar to how comic books for a long time struggled to be taken seriously because the popular perception of a comic book is ridiculously muscled men who dress up in silly costumes and throw cars around. And comic books for a long time have not been that. And it took a very long time for a public per perception of a comic book to catch up. And I think video games are starting to get there. Board games are still lagging way, way behind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one game that came to mind in terms of playing the villain that I think is very close to the line. Like, I, I could totally see someone playing it and thinking that it was just completely uncomfortable. While I think it's 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 a wonderful examination and satire. No, not not, not quite satire, but but at least examination again of those institutional incentives. And that's uh, Archipelago. I have not played it yet, unfortunately. Yeah, I've or seen, have I? Have I've I seen I different reactions. Ever. Hmm. I don't think I have played it. Yeah. Tell it, me about it. It's so it's everyone's playing basically colonizers in in a semi you know tropical generic tropical island area or archipelago I suppose and on one side there's the basic exploration economizing you know gathering resources building buildings but then there are these communal challenges that arise in terms of pushback from the natives the home country wanting certain resources extracted out and sent back to them that creates this game theory situation where everyone as a group has to figure out how much they're going to contribute to this to quelling this this communal problem while all your resources and money and such are hidden 
uh, from the other players. So it ends up, it leads to a lot of bickering and arguing while you're trying to extract value and resources and get the natives to work for you, though you can't get too many of them working for you or else they have an uprising that I think it, for me, it's very clearly like, oh yeah, I'm I'm the bad guy here. But I've, I have seen criticisms that it glorifies, although again, from my perspective that I don't, I don't see that at all. I think it actually does a quite a nice job. Yeah. Uh, it's, it seems like it's very much at least on the line. I'd, I'd be concerned about that because it, I don't know if it's got that extra layer. I mean, keep in mind uh, for, for both of us, like we have a really super privileged perspective on the issue of course, where, yeah. uh, you know, we, I, I certainly did not grow up knowing, uh, like the local tribes. I think knowing the local, tr- the, the local nations where you grew up would be like an important thing. And, um, I've only just recently learned about it now. Like, you know, who are the nations that used to be here? I mean, you think about themes that would do a better job of this. And there's, I've, I've thought a lot about this. It's ultimately not my story to tell, uh, but I'd love for somebody to pick this up. But for example, think about a game set in 12th century North America. Like that's something that for a lot of people, it's just a black hole. Mm -hmm. Like 12th century history, didn't that only exist in Europe? Well, of course it didn't. There was enormous history in North America in the 12th century. Um, And there's a lot of really fascinating back and forth. You can do a game about the forming, like one of the big confederacies around my neck of the woods is, was the, I'm going to have to use the name Iroquois because I don't remember their actual name. Uh, Iroquois obviously is a French name, but it's a confederation of a bunch of local nations that got together because they realized uh, they were much stronger working together. And uh, apparently there was this one individual known as the peacemaker who helped broker all of these deals and helped a bunch of these nations start working together. And isn't that an amazing idea for a game? Uh, I trying play to play that game. <laughs> I know, right? Uh, but even that theme is not perfect because when it comes to native peoples, you can't just frame them as being an artifact of the past. Like they're here and now. The episode of Ludology where we discuss this, there's somebody who talked with some native peoples and were like, so what's a theme you would like to make? that would put your people in a good light. And they said, ice fishing. It'd be great to have an ice fishing game. You know, I wonder what a game about uh, managing casinos, like uh, native casinos would be like. Uh, Would that have some interesting economic repercussions? And could you do it avoiding the temptation to say, well, you know, this nation has a connection to the land, so they get this special power from their totem. Like, can you do it without that? Because that's, It's a crutch, you know, it's not, it's once again, a really Western way of looking at native peoples that isn't really, isn't really helpful, you know, and I think that's why us white Western designers have to be really careful when working with these, because there's a lot of booby traps, for lack of a better term. Um, There's a lot of possible issues that you can blindly stumble into if you're not careful, you know, I think you definitely need at least some representation on your team to make sure that you're not screwing anything up. I mean, even with uh, something like Teletime, I did a small expansion for the networks called Teletime, and uh, the shows are all parodies of British TV shows. So what I did is I got a panel of all my British friends, and I showed them the spreadsheet of all the shows that I was thinking. And I'm like, what do you think of these puns? And a lot of them they were like, this won't work. This won't work. This won't work. What does this mean? Oh, no, that doesn't work, you know, and slowly but surely, you know, we we changed it so that all the jokes land for a British audience, which is really important if you're going to make something with that theme, you know, those jokes had better land. And why don't we do this with games set in China? Why don't we do this with games set in medieval Japan? Why don't we do this with games set with some sort of native peoples? I mean, these people are not totally invisible. You know, you can get a hold of them, you can show them your game, and you can get some buy-in and at least have them uh, understand, and, and, and you can better understand, you know, where they're coming from and, and any potential issues you might have with your game. Yeah, completely agree. You said before that you've kind of toned down this in a couple of your designs. Have you, have you thought about doing a design where you really lean into the villainy aspect? No, I just... 
at the end of the day, formal ferret is a business. Like, it's how I pay my rent. Yeah. So while there are some risks that I'm taking here and there in terms of, like, why the, he- why the heck did I make a word game? Uh, why the heck am I working on a story game now? You know, those are risks enough to do something that has a limited audience from the start because the theme is so thorny and possibly controversial – I think 20-year-old me would have done that. 25, maybe even 30-year-old me would have been, yeah, I'm such an edgelord. I'm going to go challenge people. And I, I feel like I've grown past that. I'm very grateful that I have. I don't think people necessarily need to be challenged or confronted or you need to get really in their face because they don't react the way you think they do. A lot of times they just turn off. So I don't want to make those hot button games anymore. You know, I want to make games that make them feel smart and, uh, you know, still making a game like high rise. I still have a little bit in that, but not nearly as much. And I feel like I can tone it down now so that most people can play it. And it's not a core part. Like it doesn't slam you over the head. Like it, it is a, it is a core part. Like corruption is a core part of high rise, but the fact that it's in a generic city means I'm making a pretty, I think uncontroversial statement that wealthy and powerful people tend to get their hands dirty. And I don't think that's an un, that's a controversial statement. I, I think that's been a truth for centuries, if not millennia. Mm-hmm. Speaking of Formal Ferret, your third game you released was uh, the first game that Formal Ferret published, and that's Bad Medicine. Was publishing, starting a publishing company, something that you had in mind early on? Or is it something that you realized you wanted to do kind of partway through your your board game design experience or history? So I founded Formal Ferret in late 2014. If you came up to me in 2012 and asked me if I was going to make a publishing company, my answer would have been a very strong no. (laughs) I would have been very uninterested. You know, at the time, I was still working. I had a day job. I was working Audible. And I, at the time, the job was fairly secure. And it gave me enough time off to pursue my hobby of board game design. I viewed myself as a hobbyist game designer. I enjoyed playing games. I enjoyed designing games. But it wasn't really part of my identity, per se. But a few experiences started to change my mind. I felt that with a different strategy, a different marketing strategy, Battle Merchants and Prolix would have been more popular. I feel that had Prolix had someone to look over the product and been like, this shouldn't look like this, this shouldn't look like that, the game's still a bit too fiddly, let's refine this, let's refine that, it would have done a lot better. So I feel like I learned a lot in those two games about what good product development is. And then I found out, like, a a lot of the Kickstarters early on were fulfilling games themselves. Like they would get the games shipped to them directly to their house. They put all their games in their garage and then they would like make enemies with the local UPS or post office by showing up there with thousands of games. And I didn't want to do that. I live in a pretty small New York city area, one bedroom apartment I'm, with a tiny staircase. There's no way a pallet's getting up there. Uh, and even if it did, there's no place to put it. So I didn't think I could do it. And then I started reading about, at the time, uh, Amazon Fulfillment Centers and how this one company got Amazon, used Amazon Fulfillment to fulfill their Kickstarter. And right about then, other companies were starting to handle fulfillment set, uh, services, which meant that I didn't have to do fulfillment myself. And with Kickstarter, I didn't necessarily need the capital at the start. I could build the capital if there was enough demand. And my views on self-publishing started to change. And then my day job, like, it started getting not as much fun. They really wanted me to see myself as a programmer and not a game designer. They wanted me to, like, if I if an emergency came up and I was scheduled to go to a convention, well, it's an emergency. You can't go to the convention. And that was just unacceptable for me. Like, I can't do that. And so I was at an impasse and I was at a a real tipping point in my life. And I realized, no, my future is in games. So uh, that's when I started. So I worked on Bad Medicine because I had the networks close to ready at that point, but I didn't want to start with that because I, if I was 
if I was going to make any mistakes, I wanted them to be small mistakes. So Bad Medicine was a much smaller game than the network. So I kickstarted Bad Medicine first because it was a smaller scope, and I'm glad I did. And then the networks was an unmitigated success, which I'm I'm so relieved about because it really launched my company into the big time. And I've been writing that ever since, you know, so that's been something I've been super grateful for. So I've been doing formal fair more or less full time since then. I've picked up part time jobs here and there. Uh, because I can't live 100% off a of formal ferret, but each year, like I feel like I get a bit closer. Honestly, this year I took a step back because High Rise didn't do as well as I thought I could. Uh, probably uh, not even probably uh, because of bad decisions I made, and I'm hopefully going to correct those decisions next year and uh, get things back on track. But uh, High Rise still looks absolutely phenomenal. I'm glad the game funded because it became a reality, and it looks absolutely amazing. It's getting assembled right now, and it should be on the boat really soon. Let's talk about High Rise then, because I know you you started a Kickstarter for it after just a few days. You decided it wasn't one day; it just wasn't getting enough momentum, and you relaunched it a, a few weeks later. What was the main uh, factor in that decision? It wasn't just the momentum; it was the feedback I was getting that the game was too expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, I was thinking that. Um, I could get into a game that had a lot of plastics and people get excited about it, but I didn't have enough of the art ready, um, so people couldn't really see what my vision was. I did a very poor job communicating that. So uh, I was asking for $100, and that was too much. So I figured out a way to drop it to $75, actually $60. Uh, the MSRP of the game is now going to be 75 but... I had it down to 60 for the Kickstarter, and that was a much more acceptable price for it. Um, and honestly, it's a it, it was a real deal for people, you know, $60 plus shipping. I mean, honestly, plus the shipping, they're paying the MSRP of $75 now. But uh, because of that, really because of the price, I needed to get that price down. So I needed to make big changes to the game. I needed to remove the plastic. I replaced it with cardboard, which was in some places a controversial decision, but I knew from the moment that I made the announcement that I was taking down the campaign, I knew it was the right decision. And I'm very glad I made it. Uh, That said, if the cardboard version of the game does well, then we're going to go back to Kickstarter in hopefully the summer, put up uh, the plastic again as a new version, as a a new sort of upgrade pack to the game. So uh, because this print run obviously couldn't be that big, uh, having just squeaked past its funding goal, I'm very grateful that it just squeaked past its funding goal. But it just barely made it, and because of that, I was able to make the game, and I'm really, really happy about that. Uh, But it had to be a small print run, and because of the small print run, not a lot of people are going to get it, like obviously everybody who backed it, and there's going to be a fairly limited retail release, and once that retail release is done, I'm sure Dice Tower is going to cover the game, various uh, other review outlets are going to cover the game, and fingers crossed there'll be positive reviews, and people are going to say, where can I get the game? And the answer will likely be nowhere, because by the time those reviews come out, like uh, the game will likely be sold out. So I hopefully will get back to Kickstarter once I come close to shipping Rival Networks, which is launching on the 14th very soon, at least in theory, as of the time of this recording. That might change uh, as things go. But it should launch in January, and hopefully on the 14th. And And once I fulfill Rival Networks, I can dive right back into high rise that's definitely a limitation of kickstarter that they are really starting to enforce only one project at a time and i can understand why they do that but at the same time there is something to be said about cash flow and (laughs) uh when a um when a company has a game that's on the water i mean that's like five six weeks that they're just waiting and nothing's happening and i don't see any reason uh, that they shouldn't be able to launch a Kickstarter then. I can understand not wanting to launch a Kickstarter while the game's still at the factory. Uh, that's totally understandable. But once the game in sh- is in shipment, like there's really no action that the company can do. Like The publisher can't do a thing at that point. Stepping back to the networks, like you said, this has been your, your biggest success uh, thus far. I haven't played a full game. I got a short demo of it, uh, I think at... PAX East, perhaps, uh, this past year. And the, and the one thing I noticed, at least in that demo, was the user experience in terms of opening up decision space was was really pleasant in that the first couple of decisions I made were fairly straightforward. There, there were genuine decisions, but the game kind of 
opened up and bloomed as I went. First, is that something that you specifically designed for? And second, if so, are, are you thinking about that from the very beginning in your design? Or is that something you kind of worry about later in the development process? Yeah, the answer is no, it's a happy accident. I blundered into the same thing with battle merchants. Like, you can teach battle merchants even more easily because it's got very much... I think with both of those, it's because battle merchants specifically, there's a very clear procedure of steps. You gain craft, you forge a weapon, and you sell the weapon, and then you repeat. Gain craft, forge weapon, sell weapon. And that's generally what you're going to be doing, although there are things that incentivize you to change rails every once in a while, to change tracks. Um, And I think one of the um, limitations of the game is that it's not really explosive enough and there isn't enough that pulls you out of that craft. There there are some interesting decisions here and there, sure. But I, I think what I did better with the networks is, you know, with the networks, you're getting stars, you're getting ads, and you're getting shows. But with the networks, the shows are varied enough and I put enough interesting things in there that you don't always have that rhythm. You're not locked into that rhythm. There's explosiveness here and there that you can that you can do that suddenly says, all right, I'm going to do this thing and that gets me these bonuses and now I can sort of jump from developing this one show to developing the next show on my next turn without having to get stars and ads. And I think that's really interesting and I think it's why the networks has been far, far more successful. But the good news about Battle Merchants is, is it meant that I could say, okay, the first thing you're to do is forge. So every, I'm sorry, the first thing you're to do is gain craft. Here are the craft cards. Cards. Everybody get a craft card. Everybody gets a craft card. Okay. So the next thing you're to do is forge a weapon. Here's how you forge a weapon. Everybody forges a weapon. Okay. The next thing you're you're gonna do is you're gonna sell. Everybody sell. And now you know how to play the game within three turns. And I didn't have to explain it all up front. Like I just had to explain a couple of things, and within like a few minutes, people were making decisions. And in the context of a booth demo, that's really, really important. Mm -hmm. So with the networks, we modified that a little bit to be more like, uh, okay, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to get a show. Everybody gets a show. Okay, the next thing you're going to do, here are the stars and ads. You can get a star or an ad, and then everybody gets a star and an ad, and so on and so forth. And so with the demo, we could open up the game very slowly and have people making interesting decisions right away. That said, you still get a little bit of that when you play it at home for the first time, because in the rule book, I tell you to ignore the network cards until season two if you're playing for the first time. Ah, so, okay. Yes. So there's, in fact, a couple of areas in the rule book where I specifically say, if you are learning the game from the rule book, skip this section. It's not important right now. Come back to it when you uh, finish the first season. Then you finish the first season and you learn about network cards and you learn about the attach action, neither of which is terribly interesting or useful in the first season. It should also be said the networks is hilarious. <laughs> that I'm pretty proud of, yes. And I had a lot of really good help with Travis Kinchy, my illustrator. He made the absolute perfect illustrations for the game. And Heiko Gunther, uh, the graphic designer, um, there we were all on the same page. We all have a trust in each other, which I really like and I'm very grateful for. Yeah, that's what that's wonderful. Let's then talk about the rival network. So that's your your game releasing very soon, um, mm-hmm. and it is a kind of a two player spin off of the networks, correct? Yes, yes, yes. So it's a two player version of the networks. I'm aiming as of the time of this recording for a twenty five dollar price point. That could be five dollars more expensive or less expensive. Uh, we'll find out when I launch. Certainly. But it's going to take about 30 to 45 minutes, so it's much quicker and much more focused. Now, the base networks game, I think, plays well at all player counts, and that includes two players. But the two-player game has some extra rules that I needed to put in to make it work, and this kind of goes in the other direction. It's a simpler version of the game that is made specifically for two players. So I think there's a lot of interest around that, uh, especially with the network's target audience. I think... Uh, couples and families really like the networks. It's a very approachable game. There's a lot of representation in it. It's a really approachable theme. And uh, in terms of ethics and politics, there isn't a lot of heft to the theme. You know, I am saying stuff like good shows get canceled on the to- all the time and a good network executive will cancel a show 
if just if there's a better show. Again, those are not controversial statements to make. And there is a little bit of catharsis I think people have in canceling a show uh, that it was really good for them to make way for a better show, you know. So mm. if they get into that spirit, I think uh, that gets really enjoyable. And I think the game's even enjoyable on a purely agential point of view. So the rival networks, I think, is playing really, really well at this point. I'm really excited to get it in front of people. And I have had people tell me that they think they think that the rival networks they prefer it to the original game i'm never sure how to feel about that you know i'm super proud of the networks but uh, i can see what they're saying because the rival networks is such a streamlined version of the game that you get the hit that you would get with the networks in half the time assuming that you're cool playing a two-player game it's very much trying to capture the feeling of the original game very much Uh, so very much okay Fantastic. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot that's carried over from the original. There's some new stuff like your shows are now your shows and stars are now measured in ratings points and ratings points now give you viewers. Um, originally, it was all one number, but that proved to be really annoying to add up at the end of the game. I found that if I sort of has said every few ratings points you get, you get one viewer and then you hit the viewers in a bank. That turned out to be a really good player experience, both the exciting feeling of dropping your viewers as now they're little chips, little plastic chips you drop into a bank uh, so nobody can see how many points everybody has. Then at the end of the game, you reveal your bank and you count. And that's always a really cool moment that you open up your bank and there's always a few more chips there than you expected. So it's a emotionally it's a really resonant moment. I'm really happy with that. Very nice. Shifting gears a bit, I I would like to talk a little bit about your time with Ludology Podcast. As I mentioned uh, before, I'm a huge fan, and I think it's it's a completely invaluable resource, not just for people who want to design games, but just in terms of understanding the games we play. Uh, Yeah. As an exercise, it's it's wonderful. How did you get into that? How did you start? uh, Because uh, as you mentioned before, I think uh, it was Jeff and Ryan at first, and then Mike Fitzgerald, and then you were the next person in? Yes, yes. So I only live like 45 minutes away from Jeff. Like he's fairly local to me. So uh, we've done panels before. We know we have good chemistry. And when Ryan decided to leave that he... Uh, He actually left to pursue his doctorate, which he has since acquired, which I'm really happy to hear about. So Ryan left and Jeff tapped Mike Fitzgerald to join the show. And Mike, uh, it was amazing to hear Mike's perspective on games. He's been in the industry such a long time. But Mike, from his point of view, um, is not an analytical designer. He's very much from the gut. So he'll tell you that something works But, you know, he's not always the best at saying why it works. He'll just say, well, this just works for me. Um, And that's not an invalid way to approach things. But it meant that after two years, he felt that he he said everything he needed to say on Ludology. So he decided it was time to step down. And then Jeff needed a new co-host. And I was fortunate enough that he dialed my number. And the answer was a very enthusiastic yes. And then the next thing Jeff told me on our phone call was that, you have me until episode 200, and then I'm gone. I promised my family 200 episodes, and then that's it. And it was so hard to keep that secret, you know? Wow, well, um, yeah, that's a like, long I knew time. <laughs> from the beginning, from my mom- the moment I started, I knew that I would inherit the mansion. So that was really interesting. So for a long time, like I was trying to decide who's going to fill Jeff's shoes. And I ran this back and forth between Jeff for a while, but Jeff slowly grew more comfortable with me. And then Jeff made his exit on episode 200. It was a wonderful episode because uh, Ryan and Mike joined us, which was fantastic to have them. Uh, and then Emma and Scott joined us as well. And I want Scott had already been submitting biography of a board game and I wanted him to have more of a presence on the show. And Emma was such a great addition to the show. She uh, studied product design uh, in college, and she really has a good understanding of a game as experience and game as like thinking about how will this game make my players feel as opposed to like how I was when I designed Prolix, which was what cool mechanisms can I put in this game, which to me is not a great way to design a game. I think you wind up like a level removed from where you should be. So I think Emma really gets it. She's very analytical. She's really good at articulating what it is she's thinking and she's doing when she's making games. Um, And as Jeff pointed out, she 
has more published games than Jeff did when Jeff started the podcast or Ryan. So, you know, she's very much um, a phenomenal addition to the show. I'm really happy she agreed to join. And I think she's been a big part of why the show has been successful post Jeff. Yeah, I've really enjoyed her on the show listening in. Looking at podcasting just from how to produce a podcast, because I kind of just jumped into this thing. I I started out, I wanted to make The Thoughtful Gamer, and I really wanted to focus on writing. And I still do, mostly. And the podcast just kind of came about just because, like, well, why not give it a shot? And so I figured, okay, I'll have the writing aspect, uh, which has all the good attributes of that medium. And the podcast, I can make a lot more conversational and and more baseline entertaining, I guess. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't know. Just more conversational. Although recently I've been wondering, am I stretching that too far? And I look at at my favorite podcasts, uh, like Ludology, like um, Five Games for Doomsday, which seem a lot more structured and a lot more preparation put into it. I'm wondering what the process is for making a Ludology podcast or like making an episode. Let me start by saying there's no one right right way to do this. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, the right way is the way that works best for you. And works best for your listeners. So I don't think, like, I'm not going to say you must do this, you must do that. I think there's some important things to do and important things to avoid, like experiences to embrace and experiences to avoid. Um, I wrote a blog post even before I started podcasting, when I started listening to podcasts, because one of the things I like the least, uh, I'll I'll show you here, uh, the thing I like the least is this. Can you hear that? (laughs) <laughs> that is one of that drives me nuts when I hear that because it tells me we're not listening to you. You know, it's like I want the illusion that when one person is speaking, everybody else is listening to rapt attention. When you hear typing in the background, that tells me they're not listening. And that drives me nuts. I I don't know how much you edit this podcast. When I edit a podcast, my goal is to make sure Number one, everybody sounds like they're in the same room. So, like, I get rid of all Skype delays. That is uh, usually because the we're, we're connecting on the internet. In our case, it's Zencaster delays. But somebody will finish talking. There will be up to, like, a five-second pause, and somebody else starts talking. And often, two people start talking at once, and then they'll say, oh, you go, you go. And none of that is useful for the listener. So I cut that all out. I'd say one of my weaknesses as an editor is I might be too aggressive there. Um, I may not be giving enough space for people to breathe, but I like a podcast that's well paced where people have energy, people are enthusiastic. And I think the other part is I want – so there's a saying in French called – I think it's called Le Spirit Escalier, uh, pardon my horrendous French, but that translates to staircase wit. And uh, the idea is staircase wit is when you think of the right thing to say – after you've left the person you were talking to and you're walking back upstairs, then, oh, that would have been perfect to say. That's called staircase wit. And my job as an editor is to give everybody that opportunity. Like if somebody says something like five minutes later that would have worked better five minutes ago, I move it five minutes earlier because that serves the experience and that helps the experience. Now, one thing that helps, I I should admit, is before I worked at Audible – I started working at Audible as a sound editor, and even before then, I spent five years in film as a sound editor. Um, even nowadays, I edit audiobooks for uh, – actually, I'll occasionally edit audiobooks for Eric Summerer, you know, because <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he lives like an hour away from me. So uh, I have a lot of experience editing dialogue, and uh, that's something I can – at this point, I can do it in my sleep. So I really enjoy it, too, because there's a lot of very interesting problems to solve. And with podcast editing, uh, it's a totally different animal than dialogue ed- than audiobook editing or dialogue editing for film or TV. So I think with podcast editing, you, all, you have the most creativity because you can really say, all right, I'm going to take this bit that – this person said at the end, I'm going to move it to the very beginning. And I've done that for Ludology. I've taken something that somebody said like an hour and 10 minutes into the conversation and made it almost the very first thing they said. And it wound up helping the show because ultimately what you're serving is you're serving the experience of the listeners. Mm-hmm. It's almost like I, I studied music recording in college and uh, I had a teacher who put on a CD, like a Beatles CD, and it finished playing and he said, what did you hear? 
and we started breaking down the instruments that we were listening. So we said, okay, well, we heard two guitars. We heard a drum set. Uh, it sounded like it had two toms, like a floor tom, maybe two rack toms, snare, uh, maybe a ride cymbal and a crash cymbal and a hi-hat. And did I say bass guitar? I think I said bass guitar. Uh, keyboards, th- uh, one lead vocalist, two backing vocalists. And he said, oh, that's great. That's wonderful. But nobody said you heard two speakers. Nobody said you listened to two electronic speakers pushing air. And I think that's – it sounds pedantic, but it's a really important mindset to have that ultimately what we're doing is not, for lack of a better term, not natural. Like we're, we're – we're, this audio that I'm saying, I am – you're not hearing me talk. You're hearing me talk into a microphone. My audio is getting digitized into zeros and ones uh, from the way that the metal in the microphone is vibrating. That's getting converted into a set of digital words, which gets stored onto a computer. They get edited, and then hopefully the dynamics get processed so that the volumes are level. Then they get put out. They get compressed. So the format of the zeros and ones totally change from PCM to probably an MP3 compression. And then they get stored on some server, they get downloaded as a file and not even get into network transport. And then they get decoded as an MP3. You know, that's a whole huge thing. And then they get decoded a second time from zeros and ones into back into an analog signal that get pushed into a a speaker driver that pushes air, whether they're speakers in your car or in your home or in your headphones uh, that wind up hitting your eardrums to simulate me talking to you. Mm -hmm. That is a lot of – that's a huge difference, that there's a lot that changes. And because of that, like people might be tempted to say, well, I'm not going to edit this because this was natural. This is how it came off. But no, it's not natural. There's nothing about this process that's natural. You may as well make the change because it takes work to make it sound natural. So um, I'm a very big believer that if you have the editing skill, I think you do it. You spend the time. And again, I'm fortunate that I can spend two or three days a month to edit these Ludology episodes uh, because, as you know, editing a podcast is not a quick process. Nope. Um, And the better you get at it, it's not like the better you get at it, the less time it takes. The better you get at it, the lower your threshold is and the more problems you hear. So you never speed up. You just get better. You just you, you wind up with a better sounding product because you can hear more stuff. But getting faster, oh, it, it at least it hasn't happened for me. Yeah, yeah, I've had exactly the same experience. Although it ended up being shorter than I anticipated before I even did it at all. Mm. I found it was shocking how simple it is to like cut out a word, yes, or cut out a breath. And there's a lot of wiggle room in like the spacing there and how long of a pause you give. I thought I was going to have to get really minute to make things sound natural, but you can just kind of wipe it out and you play it back and you're like, oh, yeah, that sounded just like he's, he didn't say um in the first place. Yeah, a good edit is one that you can't hear. Yeah. Like uh, uh, episode of Ludology has, I'm going to estimate probably about 400 edits in it at least. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, I mean, there's edits probably every two or three seconds in an episode of Ludology and you're not going to hear them because I'm hopefully skilled. You'll probably hear them once or twice because I'm not perfect and I'm usually going as fast as I can. So there are times when maybe like, I think the one that you hear the most often is if someone says, um, and I cut out the, um, sometimes you can hear them forming the you. And you hear them just forming the U and then they break into saying something else. And if you're listening close, you can hear that cut. Um, yeah. And it's it's it, that's the hardest one. And that's always a tough thing. Do I leave in the um or do I cut it out and have this that most people won't hear? And it's a it, it's a tricky call. And I tend to be aggressive when I edit, but I can understand other people who would rather leave in the um. But I find that if I cut out the ums, or I cut out the you knows, I cut out all of the filler I wind up with a podcast – like there are podcasts that I've literally – episodes that I've literally saved like 30 minutes. Like this would have been – at this episode would have been an hour and 45 minutes and I've cut it down to an hour and 15 minutes. And I think that makes such an enormous difference. I, I think it frankly shows respect to your listeners when you have an episode that's shorter. And I'm sorry. I realize I'm saying this and we're like an hour and 40 minutes in. <laughs> but I think that if you have an hour and 40 minutes and like 30 minutes of it is just like useless banter that's not 
the point or it's people – it's like the dreaded Skype delay or it's people – accidentally talking over each other and saying, no, you go, no, you go, or it's someone coughing and saying, let's go back and say that. You shouldn't hear any of that. So if it's an hour and 45 minutes, but it's all like really useful, that's one thing. But if it's an hour and 45 minutes and there's just all this boring stuff that you can just cut. I mean, this is why a lot of people listen to podcasts at 1.5 X speed or 2 X speed, because so many podcast editors, like they don't, because they have been trained in doing it. They don't cut out enough. And it winds up being – it's not as tight as it could be. And I aim for a really tight podcast. And I hate to say this. I hope my podcasts are difficult to listen to at 2x speed you know, because I want that energy and I want it to sound like people in the same room excitedly talking to each other. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's my – approach also i i'm probably i'm 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 certain i'm a bit looser with my edits than you but you know i find myself even cutting out the pauses between sentences or, or a you know a portion of oh, them yeah. just to get the rhythm quicker i kind of yep. go by my gut every once in a while i'll leave an um in just because it fits the cadence of the sentence or something yep. but you could definitely notice the difference between one that has hasn't gone through any edits at all and one that that to my mind i'm doing just the bare minimum of edits of just making it sound decent <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah yeah that's a that's a big part of it in in terms of the preparation for ludology how do you guys come up with the topics is it do you do like a big brainstorm ahead of time and then plan out far in advance or yeah we try to get together about once a quarter and we talk about guests that we want on the show guests we've been trying to get on the show for months but the schedules just haven't aligned and then emma winds up with a handful of guests that she's going to reach out to i have a handful of guests that i'm going to reach out to and usually of those guests we get about 75 percent of them one or two of them it's like an outright no or no response or check back in six months uh but then maybe one or two they're really interested but the schedule isn't lining up so they say they will and then we send them a doodle poll and they never fill it out uh, we have one guest right now in that sort of purgatory, but oh, when we get them on, it's going to be an amazing episode. But the rest of them are all super enthusiastic and really excited to be on the show. And um, generally, we wind up with a really good episode. And yeah, so there's there there is some planning that goes into it. I think it's valuable to have a lot of episodes in the uh, not a lot of episodes in the bank necessarily. Depending, I have a very busy schedule. Like I go to a lot of conventions. So this last run, I had four conventions in the span of eight weeks, which meant we had to be very deliberate in how we scheduled our recordings and how I scheduled my editing time. So that when I was at a convention and we hit Sunday at noon East, uh, Eastern time, which is when the new Ludology drops, I had to make sure that episode was in the bank and ready to go, uh, with, regardless of what I was doing on that Sunday. So it really depends. Sometimes we edit the episode just in time. Other times we edit the episode and it's like two months before it even airs. Uh, it really all depends on how busy we're going to be in the next few weeks. Generally, convention season means we're editing, at, we're recording and editing far in advance. When it's not convention season, we can be a little more lax. And any white whales in terms of guests uh, you haven't been able to get on but really, really, really want to? Well, one that sadly we will never get on. Jeff actually tried to get Francis Tresham Mm -hmm. on. I think it was last year. And sadly, uh, Tresham was not in a good state at that point. His memory was no longer good. And he was – every time his assistant said – you're going to be on this podcast, you would start to get nervous. And so we ultimately decided it just wasn't a good idea. So that was one that we never were able to get on. And it sounded like even if we did get him on, it wouldn't be like he would be able to stick to the questions. Like his answers would probably most likely drift a great deal, which is unfortunate. But I mean, that's a reality. You know, he's such a hugely influential designer that I would have been honored to have him on regardless of how he was doing as long as he was comfortable doing so. Uh, so that was really one sad thing. We never – I would love to get Reiner Kinesia on the show. I'd love to talk about his approach to making games because obviously he's made so many foundational games. One of my favorite designers. There was a time like two or three years ago where it was almost cool to bash Kinesia uh, and to be like, oh, Kinesia, his stuff is all the same. It's all boring. And I'm really glad that there's sort of a renaissance, like people are rediscovering his games because his games are absolutely wonderful and they're they're amazing. So they're really worth discussing. Um, we've talked about getting Ale- Alexander Pfister or Stefan Feld on the show. 
I understand Stefan Zinglish is not great, so he probably would not be an ideal guest. I would love to get Jane McGonigal on the show. I think she would be an amazing guest. And I'd love to talk to her about like her current thoughts about reality is broken, whether she still believes games can change the world. Because I think in a lot of ways she was right, but not in the ways that we were expecting. So I think she would be at a tremendous, tremendous guest. Zoe Quinn, obviously, I'd love to have on the show. Porpentine, I'd love to have on the show. I'd love to start bringing, and you may have noticed, we are bringing people from outside board games because I think there's so much you can learn, especially from a story point of view. Like, how can you, how can board games tell better stories? Well, let's look at other games that are trying to tell stories and let's see how we can adapt this thought process to board games. And That's what the thrust of a lot of our recent episodes have been. But that said, part of our planning is, okay, we've been really talking a lot about story lately. Let's go back to mechanism and let's talk – let's do a good old crunchy episode and and work on that. So it's a lot of it is maintaining that balance. But those are some of my my dream guests. And I'm sure there are others that – (laughs) oh, absolutely one – guest I would love on the show. I'd love to talk about a fledgling sports league. And when you make a decision between entertainment and agency, like on one hand, you have, I'm going to go totally gonzo. On one hand, you have professional wrestling, which is pure, pure entertainment as it should be like there's nothing wrong with that. You know, it's pure entertainment. I would argue it's not a game. I would argue that it's pure play. Uh, because the contestants know the outcome of the match, generally speaking, but it's still a lot of fun. You know, that is pure entertainment. On the other hand, you've got Formula One, which I think is the complete opposite, which is the best drivers in the best cars. And the result, I can't speak for everyone, but for a lot of people, it's kind of dull. There's not a lot of passing. Uh, When there is a pass, it's a really exciting moment, but you get a lot of dominant stretches where one team and one driver are unbeatable. I mean, there was the Michael Schumacher era, we're now in the Lewis Hamilton era, and while there's definitely an audience for that, and it's fascinating to see the absolute best in the world compete on the best, given the best opportunities that they can have, uh, with money almost no functional object, that's a fascinating exercise, but a lot of times it, it can risk winding up being really dull. And I'm sure Formula One makes changes to avoid it from being even duller. So when you have a new sports league, how do you make those calls? Like when you make a decision between this is going to be really exciting, but it's not going to be – it's not going to do as good a job telling us who the best is versus this is going to tell who the best is – but it's going to be kind of boring. And how do you reconcile that? Do you go with a playoff format? Do you go with just a bracket uh, with like a, just a round robin league formula, formula and the best record at the end of the round robin wins the championship? That's how they do it. The Premier League, uh, they don't have any playoffs. They have a Champions League, but that's a different thing. And so the guest I would love to have, and this is totally, totally selfish of me. I would love to have a guy named Greg Munson who produces the TV show BattleBots, which is one of my favorite things on TV. And it'd pretty much be an excuse for me to talk with Greg Munson for two hours. <laughs> oh, that, that topic. I mean, I could go on and on about all the fascinating things I find in sports and the, and the structure of sports. Oh, it's so fascinating. It's game design on the largest stage. Yeah. It's so fascinating. Yeah, it's absolutely like, fascinating. I mean, coming up, you know, just... I, oh, man, there, there's so much to think about just even in, in like the, the baseball rule change they're going to have where pitchers have to stay in for three batters. Yep. Like I could I could think about that and, and write about that for a while. And that's just like one change in one sport. And understanding that baseball, there's never been a canonical rule set that this is always what baseball is. No matter what the tr- traditionalists will tell you, uh, sports rules are always in flux to an extent. And they're always changing because the context is always changing. And the managers and the coaches, they're always one trying to get one step ahead and trying to figure out the new way to break the rules. Because there are so many incredible incentives to do well that they're going to do everything they can to break the game, usually legally, a lot of times illegally, as we've uh, seen with a few uh, news stories of late. And so the rules have to stay one step ahead. And and now back to this boring thing, you know, baseball is starting to fall 
to a lot of people's eyes onto this boring side where, okay, we're putting in the best pitcher we can in this scenario, but we've done that three straight batters and it's added like 30 minutes to the game because the new pitcher has to come in, has to warm up, et cetera, et cetera. So now instead of having, okay, bring in the lefty specialist, now bring in the righty specialist, now bring in the other lefty specialist, now we're forcing um, the pitcher to stay in for three batters, which uh, is in direct response to that to to that strategy, to that tactic. And yeah, that is exactly the kind of thing that totally fascinates fascinates me. I've been very into cricket lately, and cricket is constantly, even now, dealing with these rule changes. You know, now they're the Cricket World Cup, uh, which is a format of cricket that you play in one day, and it has a timer, not a not a literal timer, but uh, they limit the number of balls that the bowlers throw to the batters. And uh, that has created all sorts of wild implications that nobody ever considered. Like, here's one great story that an Australia Australian bowler, Australia was beating England, and they just had, like, a few more balls to throw. And the bowler, you, you've seen how bowlers usually throw. They usually, like, sometimes they run, sometimes they take a couple of hops, and they bowl it overhand, keeping their, their elbow straight. Well, this bowler realized... If I bowl underarm and just roll the ball on the ground, there's no way the batsman can get a good hit on it. Like, they'll be able to get it, like, make contact with it, but they're not going to get it very far, and they won't be able to score the number of runs they need, and all I need to do is roll the ball, like, six times, and I'm going to win. And he did that, and there was a huge uproar. I mean, you've probably heard the saying, that's not cricket. Well, uh, that underarm delivery was not cricket, and uh, that was a huge controversy. Um, even though it was technically within the rules, like there were no rule a dog, no rule that says a dog can't play basketball. So uh, no rule <laughs> at the time that you couldn't bowl underarm, and of course now there is in response to that. So it's this idea of how do you bulletproof and how do you stay ahead, which is uh, a thought process that most game designers will be very innately familiar with. All the way to the legendary, I think it was a Barbados versus Costa Rica, was it? Or Barbados versus Granada uh, soccer game? You've heard of this soccer game, right? I probably have, but Je- I'm not, Jeff I'm not did, huge yeah, into soccer. Jeff did a game tech about it. Even if you're not into soccer, this was just such a wild match. So this was, I, th- I want to say, like 92 or 95. Uh, was this it the was, one where they colluded to tie? Kind of, yes. So, so yes, What the, the setup is the tournament organizers had decided that if a game goes into extra time, effectively overtime, and somebody kicks a goal, that the goal will be worth two goals. Why? I don't know. They just decided that was a good idea. So that might have been an okay idea, except that what soccer usually does is they rank – uh, a team that's tied in brackets, like if they do a round robin and teams have the same record, the next tiebreaker is goal differential. So these two teams are playing and one team is leading 2 nothing. And not only do need, they need to win, they need to win by two goals in order to advance. If they win by two goal, if they win by only one goal, that's not enough. Their opponent will advance. So they've got to win, but they got to win by two goals. So they're leading 2 nothing. everything's hunky-dory, and then their opponent scores, and it's 2-1. to one. And there's like 10 minutes left. And they try for some time, generally, to score a goal to make it 3-1, to one, and they can't, because scoring goals in soccer is hard. Then the coach has an idea, and he tells his team, okay, kick the ball back and forth, waste as much time as you can, and then kick the ball in our own net. An own goal, but a deliberate own goal. Now this game is tied, now they can ride it out a few more minutes and get it to extra time, and then kick the one goal in extra time, win by two goals, and move on. So they do that. They kick the ball back and forth. They kick it in their own net. The game is tied. The other team realizes what's going on. And they're like, wait a second. The game's tied now. If they make it to extra time and they score the goal, we're out. So if we score an own goal, we'll be losing by one goal, and that will be enough to get us to to the next stage. So... For the next few minutes until the end of regulation, it was the most bizarre and ridiculous exhibition of wasn't even soccer that was happening. One team was trying desperately to score into either goal, and the other team was trying desperately to keep the ball out of both goals. And it was the stupidest thing you can imagine. Uh, Of course, what happened is the team that uh, had kicked the own goal was able to survive to extra time, and they did kick the extra time 
double goal, and they did advance the next round where they lost. Uh, <laughs> but it's a great example of how these rules that might sound cool at the time have unintended consequences and how sports teams are going to use them to their absolute fullest. And it's why I think sports are such a fertile ground for game designers to explore. You know, with all the uh, sports are problematic. I mean, there's way too much money in sports. The athletes get an incredible amount of money, probably too much. You get issues with teams that threaten to relocate unless uh, there's public money spent on their stadiums. Uh, and these are billionaire owners who are making these demands. It's there, There's health issues. There's concussion issues, CTE, all sorts of problems with sports and uh, fully aware of that. But strictly from a game design perspective, there's so much interesting stuff there. Oh, yeah. And then the thing I'm also interested in are the different layers of incentives. So the psychology of it. I have an acquaintance back from high school who does uh, football analytics on the side. And he was writing a lot about how coaches end up making suboptimal decisions that hurt their chances to win the game in order to better keep their jobs. Oh, yes, that's the thing. There's this perception that if you're too risky, you're playing football wrong and and, and that the fans don't like it, which means the owner doesn't like it uh, because it hurts the perception of the team. And so coaches make these overly conservative decisions uh, that are praised because the regular fan doesn't understand uh, that it was a suboptimal decision. And so there's these, all these layers of incentives from the top down that affect, that affect decision-making when on the surface, it's like, Oh, everyone wants to win the game, but that's, that's a very overly simplistic perspective. It's, it's not that simple. Yeah, it's, it gets incredibly complicated. Final question about the podcast. Have you found that, that doing lud- Ludology has helped you as a game designer? It has. I mean, I think the biggest thing, I'm working on a role-playing game now, and I'm always going back to the episode re- we recorded with Jason Morningstar, uh, which, who's one of my favorite role-playing game designers. He's amazing and very, very, very smart guy. And what he's discussed, especially what he talked about in terms of like for the role playing games I grew up with, there was this idea that in order to surprise the character, you must surprise the player. Like paranoia is built all around that. You're constantly passing notes to the GM so you don't inform the other players of your plans. And it's this idea that the player and the character are linked in this way. It's this overlap between player and avatar, uh, which I in my player and three persons model, which results in immersion. You know, the the tighter the link between player and avatar, the more immersed the player tends to be. But that's not a purely qualitative thing. Like It's not like the more overlap there is, the more immersion there is, the better the game is. So Jason pointed out that you can go in the other direction, and that can be the right decision also. The example he gave was uh, this example in Dogs in the Vineyard, uh, the role-playing game by Vincent Baker, where a bartender is telling the characters – like the characters asking this bartender – have you seen where this person is? And the bartender says, yes, this person's at X, Y, Z. But the bartender's lying, but the characters don't know. And that's such a revolutionary thing. That's such a different thing. Because up until I heard that, I always thought it had to be one-to-one. But this idea that the players are allowed to know more than the characters, and then they can then better drive the characters towards really difficult and interesting situations. Uh, another thing Jason said in the episode was drive him like stolen cars. It's uh, how his friend says he likes to play role-playing games. You know, drive the characters like stolen cars. You, you've got one shot at them, so make them really good. And this is from the perspective of like a one-shot indie storytelling RPG. You may not want to do that with your D&D character that you're trying to get to the next level. But for your fiasco character they just created, oh yes, you definitely want to do that. And Uh, That's an example of an episode where I learned so much from his approach. The thing about Ludology is it hasn't really changed in terms of what I've learned from it between the time I've been on the show and between the time I was was a listener um, and not a host. Uh, Because when I was a listener, I was still learning so much. Uh, And then Jeff's game tech segments are always amazing. Uh, The study that he recently was involved with that Dr. Blessing did down in Tampa – Uh, Jeff had this thought experiment of 
what if you took Incan gold and rethemed it to be about firefighters instead of about cave explorers? So the central theme is heroism instead of greed. Would that drive the players to different decisions? And Dr. Blessing added a third condition of what if there's no theme at all and you're just playing purely abstractly? And they found that the more people played, the more that their decisions skewed towards the abstract game. And that showed within a relatively small sample size, mind you, one such study, small sample size, nowhere near conclusive. But right now, the opening salvo of evidence seems to support this idea that the more people play at least certain kinds of board games, the more likely theme is to fall away. And the players are looking more at the at the decisions of how do I win, the agential decisions, which is something that in terms of anecdotal evidence, like we see all the time. Yeah, and it's, it's my personal experience playing games. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I, it's helped me in terms of, uh, certainly in terms of the people that I've gotten to meet, like being able to meet and chat with Jason about that, uh, being able to meet and chat with people like Naomi Clark, uh, although I knew her from before from NYU, meeting uh, Anthony, uh, who designs, who co-designed Slay the Spire, all these people. It's uh, it's really wonderful chatting with them. Well, fantastic. Thank you again so much for being on the podcast. This this time flew by for me. Yeah, I hope it flew by for our listeners. I, I do tend to talk a lot. And I should have warned you from the beginning that I, <laughs> I tend to be a very, very big talker. Oh, it's wonderful. Don't don't apologize at all. The wealth of information you have is is fantastic, and I and I learned I learned a lot. Now, if you make this a double episode, I wouldn't blame you. <laughs> it's it's not the longest one. I've oh done. wow! I wow. went nearly three hours with Eric Royce, which I had told him, oh, it's probably going to be about an hour, and we just talked and talked and talked. So, well, Eric's fantastic. He's oh, a he's great, great designer great. and a great person yeah yeah well thank you again thanks for listening everybody if you want to look up what gil's doing you can look up the ludology podcast uh you have your own personal website gil.hova.net yep and there's also formal ferret i don't update gil.hova.net as nearly as often as i should i've got a ton of ideas of blog posts and absolutely no time to write them but hopefully i'll get back to it and then you're on twitter i know that right at gilhova yep that's how you can get in touch with Gil and look at what he's been doing. Also, check out the thoughtfulgamer.com. I am on social media, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Please rate and review the podcast at, on iTunes, wherever you get podcasts. And if you would like to support the podcast, go to patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer. Thanks for listening, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs>